So please help me welcome Jose Avila from Crowdstar. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for having me here. I'm very excited to be here. I hope all of you are having a great time in Barcelona. So I'm the VP of Engineering for Crowdstar, and I'm going to show you a little bit about what we're doing. So Crowdstar, well, we were founded back in 2008 in the good old heydays of the Facebook gaming platforms. Uh, yes, we're responsible for a lot of those requests you guys got. I'm sorry about that. Um, we had published over 25 titles. And we had over 300 million users have been playing our game. Um, in 2011, we decided to make a shift to mobile. And we created the first mobile title for women. It was called Top Girl, and it was a top grossing uh, game for quite a while. Uh, in 2013, we made the shift and uh, decided that you know, we needed to give more for the entertainment for women. And we created uh, Covet Fashion. So Covet Fashion is the first um, mobile entertainment platform for women that makes use of real brands and real uh, uh, items uh, that you can purchase on any store around the world. Um, it's a competitive platform, so what's that, right? Well, Covet Fashion allows women to dress up um, an avatar or a you know, personality for events that we deliver to them on a daily basis. Uh, they create over 150 million looks um, a month, and then they submit these looks for uh, voting on, uh, on the platform. Over half a million um, women play this game around the world, and they vote uh, 50 million times uh, a day on these looks. Um, what are they looking for? Well, everybody wants to have the top uh, look in the game, um, and the, the competition is very fierce. Uh, Covet Fashion is um, published in iOS, Android, and Kindle, and it's available around the world in six languages. Now, what you guys really care about is how we, what we get this running. So, Covet Fashion has been deployed across four data centers in the US. Um, we're using a multi-cloud infrastructure, and we have a combination of KVM and Vermetal on some of them. Uh, we use about 200 servers, and we process about 100 million API calls a day. Now, we've been developing this over three years, and a lot of challenges have come up. Um, the first one was we were traditionally launched on virtualized um, instances which are great for scaling up, but everyone can agree that it gets very expensive once you reach a certain scale. Uh, we needed to address that uh, quickly, and we had to um, also, with the complexity of the stack, as we develop more features and things, our bootstrapping was starting to get very brittle and convoluted. You know, traditional bootstrapping takes a long time, has a lot of is-else cases and things like that, so it was taking a lot of time and making it very brittle. And since we operate with a very small team, we needed to be able to do more with less, right? And that's where um, bare metal really came to change uh, the game for us. Now, bare metal, traditionally, everybody knows, great performance, very affordable. But you have the issues of long-term contracts and um, long delays on, on you know, permissioning all these servers. And that's where OpenStack Ironic really changed the game for us. Uh, with OpenStack Ironic, our guys have already been using a lot of the OpenStack APIs. They were able to change a few lines of code in our provisionings and be able to launch uh, bare metal servers within minutes. Uh, by doing this, our first deployment, we were able to reduce our cost by about 60% and also reduce um, our latencies by about 40 milliseconds. So that was great because our footprint actually got smaller. Um, with the OpenStack Ironic, the deployment was a lot faster than the traditional one day to a couple of weeks to get bare metal up and running. The next thing was our ops team was overwhelmed all the time by the developers asking for changes on the servers, or can I have this library installed, or oh, I want to use Node with this, or this or that. And the bootstrapping, like I mentioned, was getting very complicated, very brittle. Uh, sometimes somebody would change something on one of the servers, and it was just unsustainable for us. And that's where containers really you know, came to really save us uh, on a lot of these things. I mean, it's no silver bullet, but it's very close to getting there. Uh, with containers, we were able to give control back to our developers, right? By providing a container to the developer and moving the application into this logic, the developers were able to start changing what they really needed, 
right? Not depending a lot with the server that it was running on, uh, making sure the libraries were there. They were able to you know, modify the image. And then once they were done, our operations team would just have to check it out, make sure that they didn't do anything they weren't supposed to, uh, bundle it up and make it um, available on the repository. By doing this and using orchestration and a lot of their stuff, um, it allows us to actually create safer and simple, uh, safer deployments. Uh, with this, you know, they were able to bundle up the image. Because they were running it locally, they knew that everything that they had coded and the dependencies of libraries were there, right? Once it was bundled, it gets deployed, and they are able to see that a specific version of the image is already running, and that it has everything that they expected, and it's actually working the way uh, we expected as well. Um, also, for ops team, our bootstrapping went down you know, from a few thousand lines to a couple hundred, just because now all we have to do is launch the bare metal servers, provision a few lines of uh, libraries and code, and then it was up and running and available to run anything on our stack. Right? Um, the other thing is that it allowed them to start mixing uh, different stacks, a server that now could run a node implementation together with a LAMP stack or a Ruby implementation. So it really created us, it gave us the advantage to reduce the number of servers we ran because we, before we had incompatibility on the OSs or the libraries. Um, now, all this wouldn't have been possible if we didn't have a group partner uh, working with us. And um, that's where InterNAP really helped us out. So InterNAP is a very active uh, member of the community. Uh, they were actually a finalist on the Super User Awards yesterday. And they really embraced OpenStack. They're contributing all the time. They have a lot of commits. And for us, you know, they gave us access to over you know, 15,000 bare metal servers that are being provisioned right now with a very broad um, configuration profiles. Right? So this gave us access to raw power in the bare metal infrastructure to be able to run our things uh, at a very more, uh, affordable price. Uh, they have data centers across the US, and they have a great team that helped us all the time. Um, so coming down for us in the future, we're actually uh, launching our first competitive home design title. Uh, if I can explain that, basically, users around the world are going to be able to use um, real brands and real furniture that exist, and you could go to a store uh, made by most of the, some of the most exclusive uh, designers out there and style their rooms for a specific um, look that they're going for, and then compete again the same way that they do with, uh, with fashion. Uh, this is live already in Canada, and we're getting uh, some great feedback, and it will be available um, uh, mid-November around the world. It will be published in iOS and Android. And uh, we're very excited about it. It looks beautiful. I mean, make sure you check it out once it's live. Uh, also, if you want to know a little bit more about how we're doing this transition into bare metal using Ironic, containers and orchestration. Um, we're giving a talk tomorrow at 5.30 uh, on room 211. I hope you guys you know, will come and check it out, and hopefully we can learn more from you guys. Thank you very much. <laughs>